Well, we're in this uh, series on how to walk in the abundance and prosperity of God. And the good news is available. The bad news is you have to walk in it. <laughs> Hallelujah. We left off, if I remember it, last Wednesday, uh, rehearsing what I heard Kenneth Hagin say, especially in 1991 Winter Bible Seminar we've just got done listening to in our vehicles. The Word, the Word, the Word. Amen. Stay with the Word. And then I left off, if I remember it, last Wednesday talking about the great pains God went to to get us this book. Uh, when it first was translated into the common man's language, men were murdered for printing the Bible. When uh, Gutenberg invented the printing press and then uh, the Bible began to be printed in the common vernacular of the people, whether German or French or English, men were put to death for printing the Bible. See, we take all this for granted. And then why is it, for example, I hold in my hand a 1984 translation of the New International Version. Why is it you can't buy this? This was the best-selling Bible in the history of the world. But you can't buy it. That's why, you know, we're constantly searching eBay. This particular Bible is great for somebody my age. See how big that print is? <laughs> so it's great for speaking. In other words, I don't need glasses to, to speak out of it. See, I can read that. And if I can't exactly read it, well, I remember what I can't read. So, you know, God's good. <laughs> but I've got two or three stacked up in my office in a cabinet that I found on eBay that were what they call new old stock. In other words, it's new, but they never sold it. And then I buy it. Why? Well, because this has been sanitized. I knew uh, one of my New Testament professors at Central Bible College was actually on the New Testament committee for the American Bible Society. And uh, he worked on the 78 edition and then the 84 revision, which were uh, good translations. You understand the New American Standard is probably the best translation of the Bible, but it's not that readable. And I, when I had made these decisions way back in the late 70s, I chose the NIV because it was probably the second closest translation, but it was readable. And my thinking was, you got to have a Bible people can sit and read. If they get worn out with it. And that's the reason why I'm probably the only word of faith preacher in America that doesn't preach out of a King James Bible. Well, it'll just wear you out. Right. <laughs> Amen. I love it. Psalm 23 is one of the most beautiful passages in the English language in the King James Bible. I love it. I love it. I love it. But, you know, just try going home and reading Deuteronomy in the King James. I'm telling you, <laughs> if you cannot sleep open up a King James Bible and start reading the book of Deuteronomy and you'll be a goner within minutes. Amen. So, but, but my point is the word, the word, the word. Everybody say it. The word, the word, the word. The word, the word, the word. So I hope you uh, brought your spiritual seatbelt because I'm going to rock your world here. Uh, why is the body of Christ so poor? Why is the body of Christ so broke? I left off last time, Romans 10, 8 to 10. I used to teach this up at I-30 as the principle of faith. And if it works for salvation, it just stands to reason, right? If this works for salvation, it's got to work for healing or prosperity or whatever. Because salvation is the biggest miracle of all. Romans 10, 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess, homologeo, to say the same thing God says, to say it, to agree, to make a statement, a statement in agreement upon. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess, homologeo again, and are saved. So this is how faith works. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth. And this is why there's so much 
animosity toward confession. I remember my own uh, parents, the animosity we got. You know, children, you know, they, they, they go through things. I mean, it's just what they do. And I went to the Lord about this once, and the Lord spoke to me and said, you know, this is part of how children build their immunities. They go to school, there's a bug going around, uh, they catch it. Then their body fights it off. This is part of the design, how God designed us. And, uh, but you know, my parents would visit and they'd say, you know, Austin's sick or Christina's sick. We say they're not sick, they're, they're overcoming. You know, yeah, they got some symptoms, but they're overcoming. And man, the, the, the animosity. Mm-hmm. So why is there all this animosity against confession? And the reason is because uh, Satan knows the power of it. Man doesn't, but Satan does. So there's actually a negative, this is where we left off last Wednesday, there is actually a negative Christian peer pressure against you taking your place in Christ. And you need to understand that. The word of faith message is basically agreeing with what God says. Say it out loud. The word of faith message faith is basically agreeing with what God says. All right, so if you're new to the church, let me ask you this. Where's the risk in that? I don't see any. To to agree with God. Where's the risk? You know where the risk is? You might offend the world. And that's why people knuckle under. Amen. Amen. So we're talking about agreeing with what God says. We're talking about honoring what God says. We're talking about saying what God says. What did God say to King Saul through Samuel the prophet? Let's start there. 1 Samuel 2.30. 1 Samuel 2.30. Those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be disdained. Those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be disdained. I looked this up. As a noun, the word disdain means the feeling that someone or something is unworthy of one's consideration or respect. Contempt. Synonyms are contempt, scorn, scornfulness, contemptuousness. As a verb, disdain means to consider to be unworthy of one's consideration. Do you want the the king of kings and the lord of lords to consider you unworthy of consideration? Synonyms, scorn, deride, regard with contempt. And here's what people do. And, you know, I mean, since I saw you seven days ago, man, I mean, I've had this uh, illustrated to me in total, absolute living color. Here's what people do. Rather than build their lives on the Word of God, I said, I'm doing a champion builders group right now, and I told the guys that if you were to boil down discipleship into one sentence, and what I'm going to say will hit some of you sideways, but I, I stand by it. If you were going to boil down discipleship to one sentence, I would make this it. Discipleship is making the Bible the Lord of your life. Now that hits people sideways because they they want to automatically think, you know, of law and legalism and all of that. Well, if you actually study it, you can understand there's this part called the Old Testament and then there's this part called the New Testament. We don't throw out the Old Testament because the book of Hebrews says that the Old was written as examples. And then a lot of times in the New, the New refers to the Old. If the Old were all bad, why would the New refer to the Old? Jesus quoted the Old So we read it thinking, we understand, we're not under Moses' dietary laws. Thank God, (laughs) bacon is okay. (laughs) Amen. Amen. We're not under Moses' dietary laws, but it's still a bad thing to commit murder. I don't care what anybody says. It's still a bad thing to covet your neighbor's wife. It's still a bad thing to bear false witness. And they'll put you in prison for some of this stuff. Amen. Amen. So, one of the the decisions Sue and I made early in our marriage, and I believe that it has impacted us as much or more than any decision we ever made, 
we made a decision, we came into agreement, we made a decision early in our marriage that if we came across anything in the Bible that prohibited what we were doing, we would stop it. And we decided that if we came across anything in the Bible, the Bible taught to do, and we weren't doing it, we would do it. And I'm telling you, all the way down to saving money, there has probably hardly been a decision we made that impacted our lives more forcefully and positively than that one decision. If I find it in the Bible to do and I'm not doing it, I'm going to do it. If I find something in the Bible that prohibits what I'm doing, I'm going to stop it. That's it. Amen. Now, let me give you an example that's within a year. I'm sitting in the back behind uh, the stage. This was inside of a year, and I'm reading Isaiah 53. I was in a fast. I'm reading Isaiah 53, and it talks about giving to the poor. And Austin's back there, and Sue's back there, and I, I told them out loud I was taught wrong. Just like that, change. It bothered me to change. I learned this from Fred Price. It didn't bother me to change because I intend to be right. If I find out I've been wrong, man, I just change. Yeah. Bother me to change. And you can't improve if you don't change. Right. Right? right? right. And so what did I do? You saw it with your own eyes. I came out here. I started giving away money every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. We started giving away money to ministries that emphasize the poor. And uh, every Friday, checks go out. Just change. And I'm telling you, since we made that change, I'm telling you, man, I mean, you can feel it. I mean, it's like six or seven on the Richter scale. I'm telling you, you can feel it. Amen. Amen. So just doing that one thing, making what I find in here. And here's how I explained it to that champion builder group. What is the highest authority in the universe? Talk to me. What is the highest authority in the universe? Huh? Well, that's kind of general. Which one? Who are we talking about? Huh? God the Father. The highest authority in the universe. The problem is, he's not here. Now, if we could talk to Jesus about a question we had, that would be just as good because the Father and the Son maintain total absolute agreement at all times. But guess what? He's not here. Oh, but pastor, we have the Holy Spirit. The problem with the Holy Spirit is that whenever the Holy Spirit speaks to you or to me, it, it comes through, even if you say it comes through your spirit, man, you cannot help but your soul being involved. What is your soul? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. But you know what else is bound up in your soul? Your prejudices. And so even myself, even myself, you know, sometimes I think I heard something from the Lord and I write it down and then I, later I think, well, that wasn't God. Uh, this is the way it works. So that's, why, that's why sometimes we will say, we'll teach, well, the Lord told me this, the Lord told me that, and we'll go to the Word to back it up. And then you've heard me on occasion say that the Lord told me this, but I got no Word on it. Right. See, that's not authoritative. The only thing that's authoritative is this right here. Now, two seconds after the rapture of the church, we'll be in the presence of the Father, and we'll be right there in the presence of the highest authority in the universe. Amen. But until then, this is what we got. Amen. And we can't go by what you said you heard the Lord say. I mean, how do I know? <laughs> Amen. And, you know, sometimes people send me, text me, email me links to sermons by famous, famous people. I assure you, I'm not going by what they say they heard from the Lord. I mean, some of the stuff being taught is just frightening. So rather than build their lives on the word of God, they just do what they think is right in their own eyes. It's like Judges 21-25. Judges 21-25, King James. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And that's where we are today. Everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. 
They don't attend church regularly. They don't tithe. They don't pray. They don't study the word of God. So what does God do? Talk to me. If, if so-called Christians don't attend church regularly, they don't tithe, they don't pray, they don't study the word of God, what does God do? Nothing. You heard me right. God does nothing because his people are dishonoring him by dishonoring his word and by dishonoring him and they're dishonoring him by dishonoring and by dishonoring him by dishonoring his word. They are giving God nothing to work with. They're not giving God any raw material. And there's word on all of this, and I thought about putting it in the notes, and I thought, you know, this study course has taken long enough. But the Bible talks about all of this, tithing, even Jesus affirmed tithing. Hebrews talks about forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. All of this is covered, you know, to pray, to study, to read the word. Man shall not live by bread alone. We could take a half hour and prove all of this, but you know it's true. They dishonor him by dishonoring his word. And they don't give them anything to work with. God, when God's people don't attend church regularly, they don't tithe, they don't pray, they don't study the word of God. They have dishonored God's house. They have dishonored God's word. And they have dishonored God himself. And as if all that weren't bad enough, by their inaction, they have given God nothing to work with. See, I've got questions. I have been saved 56 years. I have been a tither 56 years, but I have questions. Well, Jesus said, ask, seek, knock. Well, how am I going to ask, seek, knock? Well, I'm going to pray and I'm going to study. And by prayer and by study, I get answers. I get revelation. See, in other words, my prayer time is giving God something to work with. When I'm in the Word, I'm giving God something. To, he, can, he can make a verse. I mean, have you ever read something out of the Bible? And you know you've read it a hundred times, but man, it just leaps off the page. And, and you could go to court and swear to God you'd never read those words in your life before. <laughs> well, that's the Holy Spirit of God quickening that Word to you at that point in time. See, when you're studying that Bible, you're giving God something to work with. Amen. When you pray, you're giving God something to work with. Now, they may be saved, but because of their willful ignorance and willful inaction, they live under Satan's dominion as though they weren't saved at all. You, man, I'm telling you, the revelation is blinding. I wrote this today. I have been saying for weeks that we collectively, not you and me, not Faith Christian Center, but we, the church, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, since the passing of the first generation, we have not comprehended what Jesus has done for us and we have not walked in it. You wonder why I'm animated and why I'm full of life? Because I am on the hunt of this one thing. I would say for weeks, that's all I'm studying at the house is the finished work of Christ. That's it. That's what I'm studying. What has Jesus done for us? Because I'm determined, I'm determined to walk in it. Amen. 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 Well, What happens when people, through their own ignorance or inaction, they don't pray, they're not in church. See, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I just had uh, Sue's niece just got married, her oldest niece, and that's where we went over the weekend because she's been a big, big blessing to us. She's helped us, so we felt obligated, okay, we got to go to that. So we went, you know, nice young man, you know, they met at a, uh, both of them volunteering at a Chinese mission. What a great story. The whole thing is a great story. And so, you know, my lovely wife, she's always so positive. Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful, you know, all that. I said, well, they have a huge, they have a huge negative. As you know, Sue doesn't believe there's a negative about anything except non-organic food. <laughs> Well, what's that? 
I said, there's no great church in Cincinnati. See, you all take this for granted. I grew up in a great church. You, you just take it for granted. The Garcias moved away. You ask anybody that's ever moved away from here for work and come back, they'll tell you there's nothing like it. Amen. 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 You just take it for granted. That's right. And I have so carefully trained Austin and Aaron, it doesn't even matter if I'm here. What do you get if I'm not here? The word, the word, the word. Not, a, not somebody's dream, you know, <laughs> ate too much pizza and here's what the Lord said to me. No, no, no. You get the word, the word, the word, because it's all about the word. All right. So what happens when people through their own willful ignorance or their own willful inaction, what happens to them when they don't, they don't gain revelation? See, that's what it's about, man. It's about the word. It's about revelation. I've been studying the finished work of Christ for weeks. That's all I'm studying. I mean, I, I got to study to talk to y'all. But I mean, you know, if, if a preacher who just studies to, to teach or preach, he's worthless. He ought to be fired. No, I'm studying other stuff all the time. And I'm studying the finished work of Christ. And I'm telling you, my heart is so full of joy. I, I'm ready to just explode. I'm telling you. Revelation. When we pray, we gain revelation. When we study the word, we gain revelation. If you're in a good church, you gain revelation. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You gain revelation. All right, so what about the person who's not in church? They're not praying. They're not stuttering, studying. They, 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 never have, they never give God any raw material to work with. They, they never gain any revelation on anything. And the bottom line is Satan is able to rule them and dominate them as if they were unsaved. Colossians what does uh, 113 say? Is it 113? Thanks be to God who has translated us from the dominion of Satan into the kingdom of his own dear son. See, when you were lost, you weren't just undone. You weren't just dead to God. You weren't just uh, on your way to hell. You were under the dominion of Satan. So he could just rule your body. He could rule your mind. He could rule your emotions. We have been translated from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of God's own dear son. But if people walk in willful in ignorance and if they walk in willful inaction, Satan is able to dominate them as if they were still lost because they don't know. They don't know their rights. They don't know their privileges. They don't know who they are. They don't know what belongs to them. And I'm telling you, it's held the whole church world back. Man, you let somebody show up with a hot wife, people get mad. You let somebody get a job, a, a, a great job, people get mad. You let somebody get a promotion, people get mad. You let somebody buy a new car, people get mad. What kind of mentality is this? I mean, I don't know about you, but I am serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I don't know about you, but I'm serving, I'm serving the, the, I mean, forget about the Queen of England and forget about the President of the United States. I'm talking about, I am serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What kind of a low down, dirty dog father would he have to be to not want me to be a success? But see, if people don't come to church, a great church, if people don't pray, if people aren't in the word, Satan can rule them and dominate them. And I'll tell you what, man, I have lived my last day with Satan dominating any part of my life. Amen. I say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Faith Christian Center has experienced its last day with Satan dominating any of us. Amen. Yeah. 
We come into revelation. We find out who we are. We find out what Christ has done. But then we got to walk in it. Now, that doesn't mean the devil's done. But see, if you don't know your rights, you know, if somebody knocked in my house tonight and said, we want to search the place, I'd say, you know, I, I, I can't say what I would say. <laughs> but it's kind of like a rougher version of shove off. <laughs> but ignorant folk, we want to come in and look around. Oh, okay. See, how can you defend yourself if you don't know your rights? How can you say to Satan, no, you're not pulling that here. We're not going to have that here. If you don't know your rights. I mean, it, I mean I'm talking about it impacts everything. When you get up and go to work, if you, think, if you think God is against your success, man, you are sabotaged before you ever get out of the shower. Amen. But, if you, but if you get up in the morning and you think, man, God is for me, Psalm 1, glory to God, he blesses all the work of my hands. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when you come out of the gate, I mean, Satan's just afraid. Amen. You have to know who you are. Because these so-called Christians don't attend church regularly. They don't tithe. They don't pray. They don't study the Word of God. Satan is free to steal, kill, and destroy their lives and their families. And then when the banker or the lawyers or the doctors say there's no more hope, then they come to God's house, and then they come to God's man, and then they want a private church service, and then... They want the man of God to perform some magic trick to get them out of their jam. It doesn't work like this. See, I am the patient farmer. And I am waiting for the crop. What am I doing right here? I don't need to be here. I could be in San Francisco eating at my favorite restaurant. I could be in Bell Harbor eating at my favorite restaurant. I could be, I could, I could be laying in my cabana. They got laid out for me down there in Cancun. I mean, I'm telling you, I don't have to be here. I am the patient farmer, and I'm sowing, 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 and I'm watching, and I'm waiting for a crop. Come on, and, and let, the, let the Word of God germinate and take root. And it's going to produce all kinds of beautiful stuff. Man, it's going to produce beautiful children. It's going to produce healthy children. It's going to produce jobs. It's going to produce cars. It's going to produce houses. Glory to God. It's going to produce fruit and your, uh, peace in your homes that pass understanding. I'm telling you. That's what I'm doing. I'm sowing the word of God, man. What's it? What's it? That pastor's crazy. I'm sowing the word. And then I wait patiently because the harvest is coming. The harvest is coming. The harvest is coming. And if you have, I got a guy in this church. He sat up there at I-30, I don't know how many years, two decades before he just woke up. And now he's a big giver. He just woke up. So I'm praying in Jesus' name. You're waking up right here, right now. Because God is able to do immeasurably more than all you have asked or imagined. Man, you think you're knocking it out of the park? I say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you have barely come out of the gate. Amen. Amen. And don't miss Father's Day. I wrote that Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Don't miss it. 1 Samuel 2.20, those who honor me, I will honor it, but those who despise me will be disdained. In other words, he's just going to ignore you. Friday night, I was sitting at dinner and minding my own business and doing nothing spiritual when the anointing of God fell on me as powerfully as I have ever felt it. There was a man there, a Christian man, who is in big medical trouble. I looked over at him and I asked the Lord, what would you have me do? And the Lord said, nothing. Do absolutely nothing. Now, I'm committed to obeying the Lord. And I miss it plenty. But I don't 
go when the light's red and I don't stop when the light's green. In other words, if the Lord says do something, I'm going to do it. If the Lord says don't do something, I'm not. So he, he was teaching me. See, and, and I know I get hate whenever I say this. The word will work for anybody who works the word. Amen. I don't care if you're white, black, Hispanic, Oriental, Islander, male, female. And, and stop telling me you're old. Stop coming out to the fellowship atrium and telling me you're old. <laughs> You're not old. Methuselah lived to 969 years. You know, you're not old. Stop it. Amen. 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 Man, I'll tell you what, man. I, 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 I get around some relatives and I'm just asking myself, I'm the youngest looking guy among them. I, I, what's the deal, man? You know what it is? They just need to get up and dance and pray and sing and shout. Glory to God. Amen. 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 I know exactly what it is, man. It's Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all His benefits. But see, if you don't read, you don't know you got any benefits. He forgives all of my sins and heals all of my diseases. He redeems my life from the pit, and He crowns me with love and compassion. And here it is, here it is. He satisfies my desires so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. See, if you got an old-looking wife, well, you shouldn't have her cutting the grass. <laughs> See, if you'd walk in the prosperity of God, you could hire somebody to do that. You wouldn't have to send your wife out in August to cut the grass. I'm telling you, I'm, I know I'm being funny, but I'm telling you, man, part of prosperity is not slaving like a slave. Not working like a dog till the day you die. Amen. 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 Those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. What did God say to King Saul through Samuel the prophet? Those who honor me, I will honor, be, honor me, but those who despise me will be disdained. What did Solomon say? Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. What does it mean to honor the Lord with your wealth? Well, we, we honor the Lord with our wealth by honoring the Lord with our money. Why is money so important? Lester Summerall, one night, two houses ago, leaning across the coffee table, chastised me. He w I had many fathers in the faith, but he was my primary mentor. And he... And I had a different relationship. I had a cell phone number. Uh, you know, I could, I could tell him anything. But he leaned across that coffee table and he chastised me because he'd been watching our television broadcast. And he chastised me. He said, he said you're not strong enough on money. Son, you're not strong enough on money. And here's what he told me. He said, son, you've got to get their money, because if you don't get their money, you'll never have their hearts. Amen. Right. Now, you know, I don't get all the money. I mean, we got all these millions of assets sitting here, more than half paid off. So it's not about that. Where a man's treasure is, and who said that? Jesus. Jesus. Where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. And that's, that's why to show honor to the Lord, it's going to involve my time. See, that's another thing. People, they don't want to give it up. Well, see, the Lord wants exactly what you don't want to give up. What, what is it people don't want to give up? I'll tell you exactly. They don't want to give up their money. They don't want to give up their time. And they don't want to give up their sex life. Well, you want to walk in victory? Amen. It's going to cost you. You're going to have to give God what he demands. You're going to have to give up some of your time. And I notice all these people that don't go to church on Sunday, they're not uh, holding prayer meetings. <laughs> they're on golf courses or whatever. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And then you're just going to have to live a good, straight, clean, moral life Amen. with your body. Amen. Amen. 
Isaiah 29, 13. Isaiah 29, 13. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. Lip service. Matthew 15, 8 and 9. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Mark 7, 6 to 9. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Then he says, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Honor is the missing ingredient for the body of Christ today with regard to abundant success and wealth. Honor is the missing ingredient. I mean, we, we, got, we got millions of these Christians, I guess. They're Christians all over, and you, you can't teach them anything. You can't tell them anything. And I find myself imitating God. You know, I've got a relative, and if you try and tell them anything, oh, I know that. Oh, I know that. I learned that years ago. He already knows everything. So, so you know what I tell him? Nothing. You know what I do? I disdain him. Because there's no productivity in it. I mean, I can talk to a cab driver and get, you know, get more reciprocity. And it's not like I'm trying to always teach. But when people come to you and they have all these issues, they have all these troubles, they have all these diseases, they have all these problems, you want to try and help them. It's your nature. You're a child of God. You're a Christian. You want to help them. Well, you know the words, yeah, I know that. Oh, well, you know the words, oh, yeah, I know that. Well, what would you tell me your problems for? <laughs> you already know everything. Yes. <laughs> Now, brace yourself, because I'm going to offend you. You know, for years, I mean, I pulled up to my paid-off house and my paid-off Bentley, and, and when I hit the garage door opener, I said to myself, what the hell do I know? And if anybody was in the car, I'd say it out loud. Because you just get, as a minister, you just get fed up to your fullness with people, and they won't hear you. Now, you're here on a Wednesday night, so probably you're beyond this. But I want you to see how God is not sabotaging anybody. God is not holding back anybody. God is not keeping anybody in sickness. God is not keeping anybody down. Well, it's the devil. Yeah, but it's only the devil because people won't do what the Word of God teaches them to do. And because they won't do what the Word of God teaches them to do, or because, which is related to not doing what the Word of God teaches to do, they're ignorant of their rights and privileges under the new covenant, Satan is able to dominate them just as though they were sinners. But it's still all, you trace it all back, it all goes back to their unwillingness to hear and to do. And I could teach till midnight. And man, I tell you, I am wired. Fear not. <laughs> Austin asked me, we were at the last Holy Ghost meeting we went to, Kenneth Hagin meeting. Um, that was in Denver. And the only reason, I didn't want to go. Hagin meetings were all about who was there. There's great revelation in what I'm about to say. Same man, same Bible. He typically would teach on similar topics so we could say the same word. But his meetings were all about who was there. 
you had the right guys, and I'm telling you, they just pulled the anointing out of the man. I'm telling you, my God, the words I heard, the words I got, the, the man came and prophesied over Sue and me in Jackson, Mississippi. My God, how I got stuff out of them. But it was about a half a dozen of us. And so we would, you know, communicate. Are you going to this? You going to that? You know, yes. Okay, I'm going. No. Okay, well, I'm going to miss that one. Okay, so the only reason I went was because Sue wanted Austin to see a church in a mall. You know, he hasn't seen that. You need to take him. And it was Wally Hickey's church, Marilyn Hickey's church. And we went. And I'm telling you, it was as dead as Julius Caesar. I mean, the man sitting ahead of me wouldn't even shake my hand. Austin said, what's that about? I said, well, I'm on TV in this town. And uh, so we get to dinner at Papa Do's, and Austin says, he says, oh, tell me, how can the word work so powerfully for you? But it doesn't seem to work at all for these people. I've seen, he told me, I've seen the same people dating for years. Nobody gets married. I've seen the same people married for years. Nobody gets pregnant. He said, I've seen, this, seen the same preachers wearing the same clothes, wearing the same watch for years. See the same preacher's wives wearing the same rings. No, no, nothing new. And I've pondered it all of these years. My God, my God, my God. I'm telling you, if you want for from this day to your last day to be a whole nother level. Man, you got to get Isaiah 119 down in your heart. I don't know how many times I heard Kenneth Hagin teach on Isaiah 119 and tell the story about how he was broke and he had no money for gas and he just had enough gas to get home and his tires were worn out and he was driving down the highway late at night after preaching the last message and it seemed like the tires were singing to him. You know, you're not even going to get home. You're, you're, you're broke. Uh, and he, he was getting ready to go home and tell Aretha that, you know, he barely got enough out of the meeting to buy a gas to get home. And he went to the Lord about it. I, I, I obeyed you. You know, you told me to leave my last church. You told me to go out on the field. You told me to go out on the road. I, I obeyed you. How can I be so messed up? I was there. I was there as recently as 1989. I thought I was praying. I wasn't praying. I was complaining. Lord, I, I said, I'm tired of not ever having any money. And the Lord took him to Isaiah 119. He's driving home late at night. Those bald tires singing to him. The wind is down. And the Lord said, son, you don't have all your needs met because you don't qualify. And the Lord told him, took him to Isaiah 119. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. If you, yeah, and, and Hagen protested, yeah, I, I obeyed you. You told me to leave my last church. You told me to go out on the road. And the Lord said to him, he said, yeah. He said, you obeyed me, but he said, you weren't willing. And, and then he proceeded to tell the story about it, the pressure in those days and how preachers would get together and they would talk about how such and such a preacher was humble because he was driving some old car. And how such and such a preacher was humble because he's wearing, you know, shiny clothes. They're not shiny because they're silk. They're shiny because they've been to the laundry so many times. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, yeah, you're, you, you, you obeyed me, but you're not willing. Man, I'm telling you, there's a revival coming of the knowledge of the finished work of Christ. And I'm telling you that we're going to have to, we're going to have to just gird up our minds and we are going to have to get willing. Amen. 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 We are going to have to get willing. Amen. So I'm out there this morning praying and the, the Lord told me, he said, I'll tell you exactly what it is. He said, I'll tell you exactly what you saw over the weekend. He said, it is Christianity without joy. And I'm going to give you the reason for it. Two verses, two verses out of the same author. Go to John 16. John 16, 23. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Say it out loud. Ask, Ask. 
and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Now, go over to uh, 1 John 3.21. 1 John 3.21. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we obey His commands and do what pleases Him. Everybody say, oops. Oops. And there it is. Joyless Christianity. I'm telling you, I've, I've lived with it my whole life. People, you know, coming to church is a pain in the butt. You know, praying, pain in the butt. Reading the Bible, pain in the butt. You know, tithing, pain in the butt. You know, challenge offering. Oh, I mean, I, I, I have people, they actually miss Easter. So, you know, they think I'm so stupid, they won't realize that, uh, you know, uh, they're on vacation or something, so they didn't give in the challenge offering, as if I'm a stupid man. Joyless Christianity. I tell you, my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, that serving him and following him has cost me nothing. I say that godliness is profitable. I test, I open my mouth and I declare that whatever it has cost me in tithes, whatever it has cost me in prayer time, whatever it has cost me in obedience, whatever it has cost me in studying his word, my great, my glorious, my wonderful, my marvelous heavenly father has more than amply supplied me and he has more than amply rewarded me and he has met my prayers. He has ma- answered my needs. He, he has given me enough. He has given me more than enough. It is a joy. It is a joy. It is a joy. When he tells me like last year to give that $15,000 to those three families that, that lost loved ones in that car wreck helping Jonathan Shuttlesworth, man, I just instantly obey and I don't complain. See, you can obey and negate the harvest coming back if you obey and complain. With joy and gladness, with joy and gladness, with joy and gladness, do I serve you, my God, in my day of prosperity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, when you can go to God early in the morning and you can actually say this and mean it, You cross the bridge to a whole nother level when you can actually go to God and say, command me for I am thine. And fear not. See, and you know why people don't want to do that? Command me for I am thine because they're they're, Satan's put fear in their heart that it's going to cost them something. When I was 17 and God called me in the ministry, I was fearful. I submitted because I'd been taught in that great, great, great church. But I was fearful because I thought the will of God meant that I'd have to marry some ugly woman and go to Africa. (laughs) You know, the will of God. Well, I did end up going to Africa, but I took a hot wife with me, so that worked out. But I have learned. See, now I'm not 17 anymore. And I just want to shout it from the housetops. I want it to burn into your minds and into your hearts and into your soul that if you will serve this God with your whole heart and with your whole mind and with all that is within you, he will meet you. He will answer you. When you call on him, he will deliver you. He will answer your prayers and he will bestow on you all the blessings that a father can possibly bestow not a natural father who may have let you down but a heavenly father who loves you and has the power of life and death and has the power to heal your body and has the power to grant prosperity into everything you put your hands to I declare without equivocation that he is awesome. He is wonderful. He is marvelous. He is good. He is a bountiful blesser. I don't get mad about it. I don't get upset about it, but it breaks my heart to see people act like serving God is a pain. With joy and gladness. With joy and gladness, with joy and gladness, do I serve you in my day of prosperity? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
I'm going to dance unto Zion. Hallelujah. 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 He is awesome. I mean, in, in the moment, it may look like you're giving something up. In the moment, it may look like it's going to cost you something. In the moment, it may look like it. But he is gracious. He is marvelous. He is wonderful. He will more than make it up to you. He has been misrepresented by preachers. I hope you are honored this evening.